So hi everyone, thank you very much for coming. And my name is Rui, as you got that, and I'm a software engineer with Red Hat. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about recommendation engines in general and how to build a streaming recommendation engine on top of Apache Spark. So first I'll start by uh, introducing the concept of collaborative filtering and focus on two variants mainly. So that's the batch and the streaming uh, recommendation. I'll then look at some principles of streaming in distributed, uh, re in distributed engines, sorry, as Spark. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about some of the practical issues about using streaming and batch recommendation uh, systems. So recommendation engines are a popular method to match users and products and historical data uh, based on user behavior. And there are a lot of algorithms that you can choose from, from such as uh, content-based uh, recommendation, collaborative filtering, and knowledge-based recommenders. So today I'll just talk, I'll just focus on a particular method, which is collaborative filtering. And in the majority of cases, we assume that there's a unique mapping between a user, a product, and a rating. And the collaborative uh, aspect of it just refers to the fact that you're using collective information from a group of users. Mic is too close to you. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, is that better? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. And uh, so collaborative uh, refers to the fact that we're using uh, collective information from all the users, and filtering is just a synonym for prediction. So. We use collaborative filtering quite uh, frequently, frequently in our daily life, and it really seems like common sense when you think about it. So for instance, the main principle is that a group of people tend to collectively have similar tastes, and then it is more likely that they'll agree on some unknown product. So let's imagine that you have a number of friends with whom you share, uh, you have a very similar musical taste, that's group A, and then you have another group of friends with whom you have a very dissimilar uh, musical taste, which is group B. So if group A uh, recommends you an album that you should listen to, and group B recommends you another album, so which, which group are you going to listen to, probably? So I, th I think it's like a, a no-brainer, right? So you're going to choose group A. So that's collaborative filtering in a nutshell. So just as a bonus question, if group B really doesn't like an album, does that mean you, you won't like it as well? Or that you'll like it? Yeah, so, so you don't have information. It's not really informative to, to make any judgment on it. So it has no relevance to you. So one of the most popular uh, collaborative filtering methods is known as alternating least square. And in alternating least squares, which is usually called ALS for short, we assume that the available rating data can be represented by a sparse matrix, and we'll assume a sequential ordering of both users and products, so rows for one, uh, columns for the other. And each entry of the matrix will then represent uh, the rating for a unique pair, a unique combination of users and products. So the idea behind ALS then is to factorize this ratings matrix, R, into two separate matrices, U and P, you can call them whatever you are, they're just latent factors. And then in turn, those two factors, when multiplied back, they'll give you an approximation of the matrix R. So in this case, to predict a missing rating uh, for user U and, and the product P, means that you're multiplying two vectors, so one row and one column of those two latent factors, and then you'll get an approximation of one entry of, of that matrix, if it doesn't exist in your original one. So there are several ways to tackle this factorization problem, and we'll cover uh, two of them uh, in this talk. So I'll first look at the batch method, which is very well known, very well studied, and aims at factorizing this ratings matrix using the whole of the, of, uh, of the ratings. And then we'll look at the stochastic gradient descent method, which just uses, if you want, one single uh, observation at a time, so one single rating. So this factorization is perform uh, first by defining a loss function. And this is just a general form of the loss function. And R of x, y is just a rating that you have for user uh, x and product y. And, uh, and that's a true rating. And then you have a hat R x, y, which is the predicted rating for that uh, user product pair. And the remaining terms are simply regularization terms. And so they just help you to prevent with overfitting. And so cranking on with the derivation of this, so this loss function must be then minimized. And in this case, we take the partial derivatives of the loss function, set them to zero. 
And fortunately for us, this has a closed form solution. So we can actually derive like a formula to, to solve this. So we get a system of linear equations, and then we can implement them easily in an algorithm. So the approach to this is then we calculate each factor iteratively. So we fix one of the factors and we calculate in order of one. And then while this process is alternated, an error measure, usually the, the root mean square error or any other error measure that you want to use, is calculated between the rating matrix approximation, so what, what the, the product of those two uh, matrices, given the latent factors, and this method is guaranteed to converge. So what it means is that when you consider that our approximation is good enough, uh, so you have to stop at some point, you, you stop it, or you can even set a number of iterations that makes a computational uh, value bound, so we know it's going to stop after a few iterations, and you stop the refinement. So we established the latent factors, and now we can try to use them to recreate the original ratings matrix with this approximation. And as I mentioned, then the missing bits that we had in the original ratings matrix is going to be our predictions. And these values will minimize the, the alternating with squares recursion. So to illustrate how AOS works, so we, we assume a very quirky shop. Let's imagine a shop that only have, ever sells 300 products and has exactly 300 customers. And on top of that, this shop is really weird because customers are allowed to give ratings in 8-bit values. And we assume that this unusual shop has every user has rated every product. So you can see it's a very, very specific scenario. So the ratings matrix will then look something like this, but we're humans, so we, we really, we see patterns in numbers, but it's really difficult for us. So we usually visualize colors much better. So we can just uh, assign a palette to the ratings. So each rating corresponds to a color, and I think you know where this is going, right? So we can just make a bunch of fake data, and let's call this our ratings matrix, right? So th this is, everyone just got together and decided to give ratings to give this. So how do you perform this factorization? So the initial step is to, we fill those two latent factors with random values, and at this point we don't know any rating, let's assume that, so the product of those is going to be a random matrix also, uh, and this will lead to uh, initial random guess of the ratings, which is, makes sense. So we then proceed to calculate you know, each factor, we alternate it, and we use the estimators, keep one constant, and we alternate it, as I mentioned. And you, you can see from, from the movie that you know, after a few iterations, we, we get a reasonably good approximation of the original ratings matrix. So this is a very specific case, so obviously you're going to get a very good result, because as I mentioned, you know, this is a simplest implementation of ALS, it's like a batch ALS implementation, non-distributed, you have all the ratings, you're using all the ratings, it's quite a small ratings matrix, so obviously you're going to get good results. So a third question that you might have is, well, if, if we can perform this uh, approximation, why can't we use it in a streaming uh, fashion, right, in a streaming scenario? So if we have a new observation, we just recalculate the two factors, we alternate them. So that's true, you can, you can do that. But the problem is that when a new rating is added or a new product is added to those matrix, you're, you're basically changing the shape of the ratings matrix. So you're going to have to do everything again. So you, know, you can't cut any corners. And even if it doesn't change, if you just have a new rating, you're going to have to recalculate the whole thing from scratch. So you need to have access to all of the data. And usually that's not really uh, very good in some scenarios, right? You, you, don't, you might not have all of the data. So ideally, we want a method that will allow us to update these two matrices, U and P, just one observation at a time. And it turns out that uh, stochastic gradient descent, or SGD, allows you to do precisely that. So we just look now at the specific case of uh, SGD, which is uh, the biased stochastic gradient descent. And it is important to keep in mind that under a certain point of view, these both methods aim at the same thing. So they both try to factorize the ratings matrix uh, as latent factors, and then they can use to be, perform predictions. And the main differences are, of course, that, as I mentioned, in one you're going to use all of the data, and in the other one you're just going to use a single observation. So in the stochastic gradient descent case, we use the concept of biases in both users and products. So the bias is a measure of how consistently a product is rating across all of the users, and the same for the equivalents for the products. So the bias of rating XY, in this case, is the rating uh, 
given by x y, the rating given by user x to product y, can be calculating as, calculated as a sum of mu, which is the global bias, which is an overall average of all the ratings that you have, the observed deviations for user x, which is bias of x, and the same for the products b of y. And this bias information is now incorporated into the, the prediction uh, calculation. So we can see that in, in this uh, stochastic gradient descent prediction, it, it is the same basically as the batch case, but just with some added bias terms. So if we take the loss function defined for the batch method, we can then replace the predicted rating formulation with the, the new one that we have. And as before, we also have some regularization terms, but we don't need to go into them. And having performed the same calculations, we, we can derive some update recursions for the biases and, and the latent factors. So this is a stochastic gradient descent, so, so we're just going to perform it for a single observation. You can try to do a full gradient method, but you need to have all the observations, or many observations. And as you can see, so this method allows us to, as we want, to update the user and product specific bias, as well as a single uh, column of, of the latent factors with a single observation. So provided we have a single rating, the rating of user X and product Y, so X, Y, we can update the bias, update the latent factors, and we no longer need to update the whole of the things, which is quite good uh, for what we want. And we still maintain a convergence property. So the practical difference is evident now. So given in both methods, the objective is to estimate U and P. So with batch ALS, whenever you get a new rating, you have to calculate those two factors alternatively, right? And with an SGD-based factorization, we, whenever we have a new rating, we simply calculate, we update one of the rows in those latent factors. So this is quite suitable. So here we can see uh, an SGD method working for the same data. So this is not distributed, it's just locally done, applying those methods. And sorry, you can see that uh, as expected, the convergence is slower because we are using one observation at a time. We're not using the whole of the thing, right? But in the end, it produces a similar result. So it's quite good. It's working. So this works fine for a single machine, as I mentioned. But most of you probably are not interested in working in a single machine. You're wanting to implement something in scale. You want to implement something distributed. So we're going to look at uh, how to implement this in a distributed fashion. Uh, and this is where it gets tricky. I'm sure all of you know that you have an algorithm that works really nicely on your local machine, not distributed, and when you try to implement it in a distributed setting, it's just a mess of horrors that you never thought you have to deal with. So you have to think beforehand, and, and, but it pays off, obviously. So we're just going to look at uh, first how Apache Spark implements this, which is the batch version, and then we'll look at streaming uh, implementation of this algorithm. So I'm guessing that most of you here are uh, familiar with Apache Spark. So just a quick question. Any, any, anyone here has not heard of Apache Spark or? OK, good. That's great. <laughs> so I, I can just resume with my 10-second uh, description of, of Apache Spark. So it's a community project uh, which provides you a modern platform to, to perform uh, distributed computations. and. It provides several core uh, data uh, structures. So one of them is uh, the resilient distributed data sets, or RDDs. Also provides data frames and data sets. And so you're all familiar, I'm sure. The RDD is immutable. It's a distributed uh, type collection. Uh, it's partitioned across a cluster. And we just map Spark operations to it. So we can do just function mapping on the RDDs. And basically, that's what you're going to use. We're going to use for this uh, streaming distributed implementation is RDDs. But obviously, you could, you could use other uh, data structures. So Spark's MLE provides collaborative filtering implementation out of the box. And this is based on a distributed batch ALS, so the first version that we've seen. And the API is quite simple. So to train a model, the only thing that we need is uh, an RDD containing the ratings. So in this case, uh, ratings are just a wrapper around some values, such as uh, user, product, and rating, so the mapping that we've seen. And uh, this corresponds to our initial matrix, the ratings matrix. Uh, 
We still need some additional parameters to define our model. So one of them is the rank, which is the number of elements in each uh, feature vector, so in each uh, latent, uh, in each column or row of the latent factors. And we provide a stopping criterion to, to the AOS algorithm. As you saw, you can just decide when it's going to stop. And finally, we have you know, the, the parameters we mentioned for regularization. So we have a lambda parameter, and it's related to the loss function. And since we have the data now, the question is, how do we choose these parameters? So usually, a typical setup is we train a model with different parameters. Say you, you do a grid search. We calculate some error measure between the different results you get for your model, uh, between the predicted and the validation set. And then you choose a set of parameters which minimize the error. So you can see with, with this kind of simple API, it's quite, it's quite straightforward to do. So once we have the train model, we get a matrix factorization uh, model instance, which is basically a wrapper for the latent factors. So you see, you see you have the user features and the product features. So these correspond to our UNP matrices. And once we train a model, we can then perform uh, predictions. So we have quite a simple API for predictions as well. But this was the batch implementation, what you get out of the shelf, in, in, out of the box, sorry, in, in, uh, in Spark. So we want to build a, a streaming recommender system. And for this scenario, we assume that the observations will arrive uh, in a Spark discretized stream, sorry, this stream. Uh, and for these streams, we consume uh, the whole stream as many batches of RDDs of a certain interval window. So we can, for instance, use the first mini batch to initialize the model, and then the following batches will be just used to continuously train the model. So one of the advantage of this, uh, of using observations as a stream, is that we no longer need to keep the, entire, the entirety of the data. So we can just read it from storage if we need for something else, or, but we don't need to keep it on storage if you want. And we consider the the batch implementation with a very, if you consider the batch implementation with a very large data set where we have a new observation and we wanted to retrain the model, we would have to, to read several million ratings from, from storage, for instance. So this is where streaming uh, recommendation really, really shines. So with the streaming variant, we can just continuously train the model as the observations come in. So the MML API is quite nice and simple, so we'll try to recreate something as useful and as simple. So we'll create the initial model us using the first incoming ratings and with some parameters, so it'll give us the first instance of the model. And then we'll allow model training using a ratings RD RDD for each uh, mini batch. So for each window, we'll just use that to continuously update the model. So the first thing is to establish what we need to calculate uh, the streaming ALS. So the quantities that we need and data structures that we need to, to implement this. So we've seen in previous slides that the recursions for the gradients calculations take the following form here in pseudocodes. And mainly what we do different from the batch ALS, so from the classes I showed previously, is that we'll have something called, say, a factor class that instead of just encapsulating the, the feature vectors now also has a bias term there. So before we had a tuple of ID array, and now we have the equivalent form of ID factor, and that allows us to capture the bias. So to summarize, if we consider that we, we have a, tra uh, a train model, after we, we consider ourselves to have a train model, after we calculate the following quantities. So the user and product latent factors, the global bias, and the user and product specific biases. And once we have this, then we have a trained model. So how do we calculate this? So we know the formulas, but now we need to express them in terms of distributed operations on Spark. So I'll just quickly break down the implementation step by step. I'll show the individual steps that you need to do required to go from the initial rating stream to a trained model in terms of Spark operations. So I'll start by showing how to calculate the initial user and product latent factors. And it is worth mentioning that the operations will be identical for all the subsequent, sub sub, sorry, the <laughs> subsequent, sub posterior uh, uh, mini batches. Uh, however, for the first step, we have a special uh, scenario, which is we have no calculated quantities at the moment. So we have no ratings. So you know, the, 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 our algorithm will be completely oblivious to ratings, latent factors, and biases. So we make no assumptions of anything except the parameters, obviously. 
So similarly to Spark ALS, uh, we assume that uh, data will be in the form of RDDs containing uh, ratings, and these will correspond to a mini batch that we just got, right? So an interesting point that, that you, you'll work out is that the algorithm and, and all these data set manipulations are perfectly valid for the limit case where you just have a single rating. So if the mini batch just has one rating, all of this will work fine, which is good, because obviously we're assuming these scenarios that you have a streaming uh, model training happening, getting billions of ratings at, at each second. It might not be the case, right? You might have uh, some windows where you don't have any ratings. So it's good to know it works. And keeping that in mind, so the first step is to create the initial user and product latent factors for this observed data. And we start by creating two separate data sets from the data. So one is keyed by user, or in this case, sorry, product. And the other one is keyed by user. So you just separate them. And just as a note, all, all of these values are made up. So, so if you see something that doesn't make sense, then it, it probably doesn't. So, so, uh, so the algorithm works. Uh, it, these are the steps, but the values are just made up. So it's just for illustration purposes. Um, so for each uh, entry of these new data sets, now that we have these two data sets, we now generate a random feature vector. And this can be done by filling a, a vector of uh, size rank with uniform random values. And as we recall, we also need a bias, but we also generate a random bias initially. So we have these data sets now. So now we have two data sets with random uh, weighted factors, but these are intermediate values, and these are not our final user and product weighted factors. So we might have duplicated users of products, for instance, in the first mini batch, and we could have user X rating 10 different products, for instance, and this will not correspond to a valid, uh, to a valid uh, latent factor matrix, uh, matrix. So we proceed by joining the ratings with the generated user factors using the user ID as the key. So it's quite simple to do in Spark, and this in turn will generate a data set uh, consisting, sorry, this is the, the the generated data set, and now we just join it, and we have uh, this data set, which contains product IDs, user IDs, ratings, and the factors. And now we just swap the keys, so we get the product factors, the product IDs, sorry. So now we perform an additional join between this inter intermediate data set and the intermediate product weighted factors, right? So we're almost there. And you only now we have a data set with all the quantities that we need to update our final biases and weighted factors, right? So we have this nice RDD with everything that we need to proceed. So next step is, remember, calculating the global bias. So this is quite easy to do. The global bias is simply the average of all the ratings we know about. So since in the intermediate data set we constructed, we already have these values, we just use a Spark operation to you know, calculate the average and the global bias. And finally, we need to calculate the user and product-specific biases, right? So if you remember, those are the recursions. And what are you going to need? So you're going to need, uh, you're going to need a prediction, right? You're going to need uh, an error, and only then you can calculate the, the specific bias. So to do this, let's start with the, the first thing we need, which is the, the predicted uh, rating. So to calculate the predicted rating, we know that the prediction rating is a, a code of combination user X and product Y is a dot product of the respective latent vectors plus the biases. So looking at the data set we, we just constructed, we can see that we have all the quantities that we need, right? So we can just, it's quite straightforward to calculate the predicted rating. And we map this calculation to all of the elements in our uh, intermediate data set. So now getting the error is straightforward, right? We have the ratings in that intermediate data set. We just calculated the prediction, so we just subtract one to another. And again, this is mapped to all the, the elements in the RDD. So we're almost, almost there, I promise. We just need to turn the gradients we have into bias and latent factor updates. So we split the updated data set from the, from the previous slide into user and product factors, right? And we can now establish the gradients by aggregating each data set by key, right? 
So we separated the factors data sets into biases and future uh, vector data sets, both for user and the products. Right. And finally, we do an aggregate sum of user biases, and this will provide us with a final user bias gradient, finally. And the aggregate sum of user feature vectors will provide the final user weight and, uh, factor gradient. And the same method is applied to the product gradients. Okay? So now we have uh, fully adapted all the biases and we calculated the user and product weight and factors given all the data that we have, so given all the available data. That's good. So that's the first uh, step finished. We, we've done with a mini batch. So I promise that all of the other mini batches are going to be the same, and, that, and that's true. So, sorry. These steps define the, the entirety of one training step. So for each ob observation window, we calculate the latent factors, and on the following window, we update these factors given the current observations that we have, right? But the problem is, now we think, what if on the following window we get ratings for previously seen, unseen uh, users or products, right? Or seen, I mean, how are we going to deal with them? So the procedure is exactly the same, that is, for unseen products or users, we generate random factors as previously, and we just keep on updating. So just for the case where we get these new ratings, so for this new set of observations, we do exactly as previously, that is, we split the data set into the RDDs, etc. And I'll assume that we get a mixture of completely new data and so unseen users or products and some ratings for previously seen users and products, which are in red. And the difference now is that instead of assigning random factors for, uh, and biases for each of all of the entries, for all the entries, we just perform, perform a full outer join between them and the current latent factors. So that is going to give us something like this RDD here now. And the strategy is to keep them matching existing latent factors and create random features and, and biases for the ones we haven't seen yet. And now that we're in position of this RDD, we now can do exactly the same steps as before to update the factors and just repeat them for all incoming observations. And with this, we can continuously update our model. So as, I, as I've said, I've, and I hope it's clear now, that this will work if you have just one single rating on, on, a, on a mini batch, right? So, so nothing in here conflicts with the fact that you have a thousand ratings or just the single one. So now I'll just quickly show some results that we had from this method, which compared the streaming implementation with the Sparks batch implementation. And to train this, we decided to go for real data. And the data set we've chosen to use is a movie lens uh, data set. And this is a widely used uh, data set in, in recommendation engine research. So it is managed by the Lens Corporation. It's freely available for non-commercial applications. And you have several variants for this data set. You have a small variant, which is useful for quick algorithm prototyping. And you have a full variant, which has, uh, if I'm not mistaken, around 26 million ratings. And that's useful for more comprehensive testing if you're not going to do some stress tests with a big data set. And the data is available as uh, comma-separated comma values. You can just download it. And they contain different variables. You find out if you want to use it. But you're mainly interested in one file, which is the ratings uh, file, which contains four variables, which is a unique uh, and, uh, user ID, a unique movie ID uh, the, as integers, a rating, which is a value from 0 to 5 with increments of 0 0.5, corresponding to stars, I'm guessing, and a time step for, uh, from when the movie was uh, rated. We, we won't need that. For, for the moment. So first we'll start by training the batch ALS model using the movie lens data. So we assume that we already have the observations as an RDD of ratings, and we split the data between 80% training and 20% validation data sets. And here we don't show the steps to determine the, the best parameters to do the parameter estimation. We perform the simple parameter grid search over a number of possible candidates. And the the Spark LS API is quite simple, and to train, as we've seen, to train this model, we simply pass the training RDD, the parameters, and we're good to go. So we now use the remaining 20% of the observations to calculate the root mean squared error between our predictions and the actual ratings, and we're going to use that 
to, com to compare the streaming ALS against the, the batch ALS. And what we do now is we persist this validation, uh, this validation RDD. So we, we can use, the reason why we persist this validation RDD is that we use the exact same one for both the batch method and, and the streaming method. So in order to test the streaming version, uh, we first uh, need to define a data source. So we start with the original uh, MovieLens uh, data set and we remove all the ratings that we had from the, the validation set. And we then create a stream of, observation, uh, of observations using Kafka, using uh, an interval of five seconds between each window and a thousand observations in each mini batch. So these are just arbitrary numbers and the only reason we chose them is just for practical reasons uh, because it's quite a lot of data and, and you don't want to sit around for a month to, to wait to, to have some results. And we could, for instance, have one single observation on each mini batch, but that'll take forever. So an important thing to notice, to note is that it's not guaranteed that the best parameters for the batch AOS are obviously, namely rank and lambda, are gonna be the same for the batch version and the streaming version. Uh, so I'm gonna go in, in a second about how to do a parameter estimation on the streaming version, but for now, we just assume the same ones uh, for both methods, for, for the batch and, and the streaming version. And then for each mini batch, we then incrementally train the model and calculate the root mean squared uh, as, as with the batch version. And we can see that, I mean, looking at the results, so here the horizontal dashed line is the root mean squared error you get from the batch uh, version. And the blue line, the squiggly blue line is the, the root mean squared error you get at, at the end of each uh, uh, mini batch. So each, each time point is a mini batch, one of the, thousand, uh, one of the f many mini batches. So you can see that, that the root mean square from the streaming version is, is you know, a bit random, but you do get a trend that it's edging towards the the, the, batch ver the batch value. So, so it's, it's, getting, it's getting quite, uh, quite similar to, to the batch version. So that's, that's good news in a way. So it's not diverging at least or anything like that, or it's not very far off. So that's encouraging, but you might think, well, now we know how to do a streaming recommendation engine. It's quite simple. Let's use it for everything. It's the perfect solution. Well, no, it's not. It has, it has many shortcomings. Some of Many of them I don't have a good answer for, but possibly you, you do, and I hope you do. Uh, so some things to consider, some problems with, with the streaming version. So a problem which is not unique to, to the streaming version, uh, also occurs in the batch version, is the cold start problem. So the cold start problem, as I'm sure you all, you all know, is the initial point in a recommender system where you don't have enough observations to make any meaningful prediction. So if you have a small number of ratings, so our weighted factors, if you remember, are gonna be mostly random values. So most of our predicted random val predicted values are also gonna be random. So that's not gonna be very good predictions. So this is not exclusive to the streaming version, but it is a word of caution that if you want to start serving predictions immediately with a streaming uh, algorithm, then possibly many of your initial predictions are gonna be rubbish. So, you know, just at least keep that in mind that you know what you're doing. So, you know, a possible solution for that is you don't have to start the whole thing from scratch. You, you, you can train the, the streaming version in an offline kind of way. So you just take a huge chunk of data, you train it, and then you start serving smaller mini batches. Um, or at least just perform some model diagnostics so that you know, you know you're know, you aware that it's, it's really bad and, and you shouldn't be telling people to buy something they're gonna regret for the rest of their lives. So another challenge that, that we have is uh, parameter estimation. So batch ALS is really nice because we, c we can perform a grid search and estimate the hyperparameters. So after some time, we find ourselves with new ratings or even new products, and we can simply repeat this procedure using the totality of the data. So just an example, if you train the batch ELS, and at some point in the future you say, oh, I don't want to use latent factors with, with uh, feature vectors with a double rank size. You can just do that, no problem. And you know, it's perfectly valid. How do you do that with streaming version? 
So in the streaming case, you can't do that for a simple reason, or at least in this scenario. Because when you have a new batch of observations, you assume that all the previous ones are gone, so you don't, you don't have access to them. You just have that many batch in that moment. So if you want to retrain the whole model and the parameters, it will be useful to have much more data. So to have, ideally, the whole of the data. So a solution is to perform a grid search in parallel, but you, know, you start with lots of models, with lots of parameters, and then as time goes by, you just prune the tree of models, you know, say this is, this is bad, this is bad, these ones are good, and you just keep the performance models. But you can see the problem with this, so, so it's quite expensive to train lots of models uh, if you want to, you know, have a good coverage of parameters, you're going to train a lot of models. And it's no, not a guarantee that the, the models that are good for the first minute batch are going to be good tomorrow. You know, so so you, you might discard model A, but actually the parameters in model A might be really good if you had more data. So you, you know, it's, it's, it's a gamble in a way. And also there are some performance considerations. So Spark's uh, implementation of batch OS is really clever. It does uh, stuff like calculating uh, inbound links, outbound links to minimize you know, joins between uh, different nodes. And this implementation that I've shown is, is a kind of naive implementation in the sense that you're gonna perform some joins and it's, you know, it's, it's a naive version of it. So you're probably gonna have lots of data shuffling going around. So it doesn't mean that the algorithm doesn't work, but probably you could build something much more clever on top of it, such as the, the Spark uh, out of the box batch AOS provides. And also to make predictions, uh, we try to perform random access between uh, the latent factors. And you know, Spark is not really good for random access of RDDs. So you know, you, you might get into some trouble uh, getting predictions in terms of performance. So uh, we're using lookup methods and that possibly is like raising alarms for some people that use Spark. Uh, so again, it's a naive implementation. So that's, that's it for me. I just wanted to give you couple of links, so if you want a, a, a written copy of this presentation, you can find it on my blog. And also, if you want to try uh, an implementation of a microservice-oriented recommendation engine that can just, you can just deploy on something like OpenShift, I seriously recommend you check out the RedAnalytics.io community project. There's a project called uh, Gemini Project, and then you can just get your hands dirty trying uh, recommendation engines with, with, um, with Apache Spark. And that's it for me, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much. We have two minutes for one or two questions. Thank you. You mentioned that at runtime, uh, when we actually apply the model in online phase, um, we should do model diagnostics to, to make sure that the model doesn't go crazy. How do we do that? Well, possibly uh, there are a couple of ways you can do it. Um, if, if you wait for a while until you have a certain uh, w observation window, or you have several mini batches, you can store that data aside, and then you can just rerun the predictions for that data with a model that you have. So you know, it's, it's not like you're keeping the whole of the data, you just say, I'm gonna keep 5,000 ratings on the side, and then a few hours later on, you, you try predicting those 5,000 ratings with a model that you have against the 5,000 rate, 5, ratings that you had. So at least that'll give you a, an idea of how close it is. Right? So that, that's just one, one way of doing it, I'm, I'm sure there are other possibly better ways of doing it. Um, just a simple question about uh, the implementation. So uh, can we s find some of your implementations of, of, of those things you talked about? Not, not, uh, not immediately, <laughs> yes. but, but there's, they're going to soon be on, on uh, one of the libraries which is available through Red Analytics IO. Okay. So there's a, 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 a library called Silex, and hopefully I'm, I'm planning on, on putting the code there. Soon. Like GitHub account or something like this where we could... Sorry? So if? no G GitHub account, for example, where we could like pick um, into the code of like your particular implementations of what you... 
talked about today. Sorry, I didn't get it. Okay, uh, is there a GitHub account where we could uh, find implementations of what you were talking about today? Yes, it's going to be soon because oh, the, the okay. Red and Oatex is a community project, so mm. all, the, all the projects are on GitHub. All right, so, so, so you can access. Thank it. you. So the time is over. Thank you very much again. If you have more questions, I think we will be happy to continue the discussion in person.